Okay. So today we're going to talk about the second and the third laws of thermodynamics. Okay. So if you recall, the first law of thermodynamics basically said that energy is conserved. So energy is neither created nor destroyed. You simply transfer it from, uh, from one place in the universe to another. Okay. So and the way you can transfer it is via heat or work. Okay. So first law basically says you can't win. You can't make energy out of nothing. Okay. If you need energy, you have to get it from somewhere. Okay. The second law deals with the, if, uh, with the conversion of heat into work as originally formulated. Okay. Basically what it says is there's a limit to how much heat you can convert into work if you're doing it using what's called a cyclic process. Because originally, second law was developed, uh, was formulated based on work with engines. Okay, so the idea was, uh, the idea is work is uh, what you might call a, a more useful kind of energy because work is something that could do things like transport you from one place to another. Okay, uh, so the idea behind the second law is uh, you can't break even. Okay, so first law says you can't win. Second law says you can't even break even. Uh, so let's just illustrate that, um, elaborate on that a little bit. The idea behind the second law came from work with heat engines. And what's a heat engine? It's a, and first of all, an engine is a, a device that goes through a cyclic process. It goes through a cycle, okay? So it repeatedly goes through a cycle. So every time it goes through a cycle, okay, you end up with the same initial state as your final st final state as your initial state. So delta E for each cycle is going to be zero. In the process of going through that cycle, it draws heat from someplace hot, a hot reservoir. Okay, in your car, where would that be? That's where the combustion takes place. The combustion of your gasoline produces heat. Okay, and then it does work. So it transforms part of that heat into work. But your engine, okay, has to dump some of that energy back out to the surroundings as heat. Okay, in the car, where, where, what's your cold reservoir in your car that takes heat away from your engine? You have what's called a radiator, where you put your antifreeze. Okay, uh, so um, that's your, um, your radiator in your car is what absorbs the heat that's put out by your engine. Otherwise, your engine's gonna, your car's going to overheat, okay? So it draws heat from a hot reservoir. So Q in in this diagram is positive, right? That's a positive number by convention because that uh, feeds energy into your system. And then it converts heat into work. So this W out here is a negative number, all right? So and it wastes some of that heat input and dumps it to a cold reservoir. So this Q out is negative. The efficiency of your engine is given by negative W out over Q in. Why, why do you have to put a negative in front? Because you have your W out is negative. So negative, negative. This will, we just want to have a positive number. So it's just the absolute value of the amount of work produced relative to the amount of heat that was drawn. Uh, that was drawn in from the surroundings. Okay, that's the efficiency of your heat engine. And all attempts to make engines more efficient basically led to the conclusion that you cannot have a 100% efficiency. In fact, it's way less than 100%. The limit is way less than 100%. Okay? So the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law says, a cyclic process is impossible if the sole outcome is a complete conversion of heat into work. That, if you, if you want to make this zero, that can't happen according to your, the, the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law. In other words, the efficiency has to be less than one, okay? Uh, a corollary to the Kelvin Planck statement is another way of saying the Kelvin, the second law it uses what's called a Clausius statement, which says that a cyclic process is impossible if the sole outcome is the transfer of heat from a cold reservoir to hot. So if you reverse your heat engine, it becomes what? A refrigerator. It transfers heat from the cold to the hot 
from someplace cold to someplace hot. What it's saying is heat doesn't spontaneously just go from someplace cold to someplace hot. Okay? So heat flows from hot to cold, not from cold to hot. If you want to transfer from heat from something cold to something hot, you can do that, but you have you have to pay. You have to do some work. Okay? In other words, you can't run your refrigerator without plugging in it. Okay? Where's the place that's cold in when we're doing a refrigerator, where's the cold place? The inside, right? You're drawing heat from the inside of the refrigerator. You're dumping it out to the rest of the house. So you're going from cold to hot. And the way you do that, you have you have to do work. Okay. You've heard of a refrigerator having a compressor. Okay. What does compression of a gas do? Remember last time we talked about heat and work, pressure <laughs> volume work. Okay. Compression means doing work, right? All right. So anyway, studies of heat engines led to the discovery of a state function called entropy. Okay, and uh, this is a rather involved process of going from measurements of heat to the idea of entropy, and that's gonna uh, uh, how you get from measure from studies of heat engine to entropy. That's gonna have to wait until you get to a higher level course. But the idea was. Uh, studies of the heat engine and the, and the discovery of the second law led to the notion that pro systems have a property called entropy, okay? And the way you can calculate entropy from heat measurements is as follows. If there's a change in temperature, a constant pressure, there's no chemical change or no phase change, the only thing happening to a system is temperature has changed, then the change in entropy is calculated by this formula right here. Okay, so uh, delta S, change in entropy, is heat capacity times natural log of T final over T emission. Okay, now if heat flows at constant pressure, like if there's a, let's say you're melting at zero degrees Celsius or boiling water at 100 degrees Celsius, if there's a heat flow at constant uh, pressure and temperature, okay, this is temperature and pressure, okay, then delta S will just be Q over T. Uh, but Q is going to be equal to delta H at constant pressure, so you can calculate delta S from delta H. So delta S is going to be delta H divided by T for a process that's happening at constant temperature and pressure, like when you're vaporizing water, 100 degrees, constant pressure of one atmosphere, constant temperature of 373 Kelvin, your delta S will just be delta H over T. Now, for chemical reactions, you can calculate delta S. It's just the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to the third law of thermodynamics. Okay? All right. So let's use those uh, equations in, so, to answer this question. What, did, what would be the entropy change? When 5 grams of water is heated from 25 degrees to 100 degrees Celsius, what's our formula for delta S? Heat capacity times natural log of T final over T initial. Okay? Think of this as delta of ln T. Okay? Because ln T final minus ln of T initial is ln of T final over T initial. Okay? So, um... Right. So what would it be? What's the heat capacity of five grams of water? Five grams times four point one eight joules per Kelvin per gram. Okay. Times natural log of so that's your heat capacity right there. times natural log of, what's our final temperature? 100 degrees Celsius, but we have to do it in Kelvin, so 373 Kelvin. 25 degrees Celsius is how many Kelvins? 298 Kelvin. Okay, so that's how you calculate your delta S. What's our delta S? 
5 times 4.18 5 times 4.18 times natural log of I'm sorry I did oh, I'm sorry okay let me take the natural log uh, let's let me say 373 first over 298 373 divided by 298 okay, and I take the natural log of that so oh, that's 0.224 times 4.18 times 5. That gives you 4.69, so 2 sig figs, since 5.0 is only 2 sig figs, so 4.7 joules per Kelvin. Notice the unit for entropy is an energy unit per temperature unit, joule per Kelvin. Okay? So that's the delta S. So that's very similar to calculation of Q, except instead of using delta T, you take delta of L of T. All right. How about this one? What would be the entropy change when 1.80 grams of ice is melted into liquid water at zero degrees? Delta H of fusion is 6 kilojoules per mole. And if you remember, at constant temperature, constant pressure, your delta S will just be equal to delta H over T. So our delta S in this case is, what's our delta H? 6.0 kilojoules per mole, but we don't have a mole. How many moles do we have? We don't know, but can we figure out how many moles we have from the mass? 1.80 grams of ice, that's grams of water. How do you change that to moles? One mole of water is how many grams? Molar mass. 18.02 grams. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. That we're looking, since we know the mass, we change mass to moles. So 18.02 grams. Grams cancel out. Divided by our temperature and moles cancels out. What's our temperature? Divide by zero. Divide by 273.15 Kelvin. Since you only have two sig figs, 273 will be just fine. Okay. Zero degrees Celsius is 273 Kelvin. So that gives us delta S of. Let's see. 1.8 divided by 18.02, that's the number of moles, times 6 kilojoules per mole, divided by 300, oops, 273, okay, so that's 0.00219, 0.0022 kilojoules per Kelvin, okay, or Kilo is a thousand, right? So that's going to be 2.2 .2 joules per kilo. So that would be the delta S. Okay. You got it? That's how you calculate the change in the entropy. What do you notice about entropy? As temperature increases, what happens to the entropy? Delta S is positive. What does a positive change mean? Entropy goes up or down. Final minus initial is positive, right? So this is S final minus S initial. So that means the entropy goes up when you heat something, right? When you melt something, its entropy goes up. When you vaporize something, its entropy will go up. So heating leads to an increase in entropy. So not only does it lead to an increase in the internal energy, it also it leads to an increase in entropy. The second law, it turns out, can be stated in terms of entropy, okay? And in fact, that's the more useful statement for us as far as chemistry is concerned. Okay, so for a spontaneous process, we say, so the second law tells you if something has a natural tendency to occur. Okay, the second law can be stated like this. For a spontaneous process, that means for, a process, for processes that have a natural tendency to occur, okay, the entropy of the universe increases. Okay, so in other words, what this gives us a clue 
an idea as to how to predict equilibrium. What happens at equilibrium? Something thinks the process stops at equilibrium, right? So when we say we've reached equilibrium, then that means the process has no longer has the, the tendency to continue going. So it's no longer spontaneous at that point. So when you reach equilibrium, you say then then that must be because the entropy of the universe could no longer increase at that point. And so you say entropy is maximized at equilibrium. So keep in mind that this statement says the universe. That means not only do you need to worry about delta S for your system, but you also have to worry about what's delta S for the surroundings. So those two together must come out to be a positive number. So when you see something happening naturally, occurring naturally, that means you have to look at that system and the surroundings. If you were to calculate the delta S for that system and the delta S for the surroundings, those two are going to add up to a positive number. You have a net increase in the entropy of the universe during a spontaneous process. Okay? So let's look at an example here. Well, let's calculate delta S for the melting of one mole of ice, okay, if the surroundings is maintained at zero degrees Celsius. And what is it when the surroundings is at 25 and when the surrounding is at negative 5 degrees Celsius? Okay, what's one mole of ice? What's the delta H fusion of water, of ice? We had this earlier, what was it? 6 kilojoules per mole, right? So what's the delta S for the ice? The ice melting at zero degrees Celsius. It's going to be 6.0 kilojoules per mole divided by what's the temperature of the ice? 273 Kelvin, right? Ice is at zero degrees. So what's delta S for ice melting? The ice is at zero degrees, right? So what would that be? Six divided by 273. That gives you 0.0219 times 1,000. That gives you 21.97, so 22, right? 22 kilojoules per, uh, 22 joules per Kelvin. It's positive. That's delta S for the ice. What is the delta S for the surroundings at zero degrees? Delta S for surroundings at zero degrees Celsius. What would it be? Well, if ice... If ice melts, what does that mean? It absorbs 6 kilojoules of heat, right? Where did that 6 kilojoules come from? The surroundings. So this is going to be delta H of your surroundings over T, right? It's just going to be minus delta S of your system, of your ice, over T, right? Whatever heat went into the ice came from the surroundings. So... If Q is positive 6 for the ice, what is it for the surroundings? Negative 6. The surrounding lost energy, right? So it's going to be negative 6.0 kilojoules per mole divided by 273 Kelvin. What is negative 6 over 273? You already did that, right? It's 22. But this time it's going to be negative 22. Okay? Joules per Kelvin. So at zero degrees, what's delta S for the universe? Ice plus delta S surroundings, zero, right? At the melting point of ice, zero degrees Celsius. What that means is at, in other words, what that is saying is that if 
you reach equilibrium there. The, the, there's no tendency for eyes or to go. There's no greater tendency in the, in the tendency. And there's no difference in the tendency of eyes to turn into liquid and for liquid to turn into ice. Okay. So there's an equal tendency of freezing and melting at zero degrees Celsius because at that point, the delta S of the universe doesn't change when you melt ice or when you freeze water at zero degrees Celsius. So we say we, are, we have equilibrium between liquid water and ice. But what happens when you're, what happens at a temperature higher than zero degrees? What will happen? Okay, let's recalculate delta S at when, oops, at 25 degrees, okay, at room temperature. What happens when our delta S, when our surroundings is at room temperature? So what's delta S for the surroundings? Again, it's going to be negative 6.0 kilojoules per mole, right? Negative 6. Point, let's, just, let's just call that negative 6.0 kilojoules. Because it's not really per mole. It's per mole of water, but this is for the surroundings. So kilojoules. Divided by, what's our temperature here? 298 Kelvin, right? What is negative 6 divided by 298? 6 divided by 298. That's 20, kilo, 20 joules, right? 0 0.020 0 kilojoules, so that's 20 kilojoules. Negative 20 kilojoules per kelvin. Uh, negative 20 joules per kelvin, sorry. So what's the delta S this time for the universe? <coughs> this time, delta S of the eyes plus delta S of the surroundings would be positive 22 plus negative 20 joules per Kelvin. That's a positive two joules per Kelvin. Entropy of the universe increases. Okay. What do we know about ice melting at room temperature? Is it a spontaneous process or a non-spontaneous process? I put ice on the, in this room. Well, but does it happen naturally? Yes. So it's a spontaneous process. That's what we mean by spontaneous. It's a natural tendency to occur. It does. Uh, don't confuse the rate with spontaneity. Okay. Spontaneity has to do with a tendency to happen eventually. Okay. So for example, the, the diamond, the conversion of diamond into graphite, that's a spontaneous process. Although you don't see your diamond turning into a pencil, right? But that's a spontaneous process, but it takes years. So you have to make a distinction between how fast and whether it's likely to happen, it's going to happen, okay? So when we talk about spontaneous, we mean natural tendency to occur, whether it's fast or not is irrelevant, okay? So ice plus surroundings is positive too. That means melting at 25 degrees Celsius is spontaneous. What about if I were to divide this by a smaller number? What if my surroundings was colder than zero degrees Celsius? What, what, what would it be if it was at negative five degrees Celsius? What would happen? Let's do delta S surroundings when it's negative five. Okay. So this time we'll do at negative five. So what's the temperature at negative 5? 293 Kelvin. So what is 6,000 divided by 293? Oops. It's negative 5 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, mm, sorry. Yeah, it's not 293. It's uh, 273 minus 5, 268. Okay, sorry about that. 268 Kelvin. So at 268 Kelvin, how would it be? Next, 6,000, which is 
six kilojoules divided by 268. That gives you 22, negative 22.4, right? And that was really, uh, our sig figs would say that should just be negative 22, but you can see that six over 273 versus negative six over 268, okay? That leads to a negative delta S overall, okay? Joule square Kelvin. So delta S universe in this case is negative. What does that say? Melting of ice at negative five degrees Celsius has a negative delta S for the universe. Why? Because uh, you know that doesn't happen, right? And so we can see that that is consistent with our calculation of delta S. Okay, so we can use delta S of the universe as a way, if we can calculate it for a particular process we're interested in, we would know if it's got, that process has a natural tendency to occur or not. Okay, and once it's maximized, okay, that means further advancement of the process or the reaction would lead to uh, no more change in the entropy of the universe, then we say we've reached equilibrium. So that's the link between thermodynamics and equilibrium. Okay. Maximization of entropy occurs at equilibrium. Entropy of the universe, okay? So let's do this. Calculate delta S surroundings, delta S and delta S surroundings from the transfer of five joules of heat from cold room air at 25 degrees to a warm cup of coffee at 75 degrees. Is this spontaneous process spontaneous or not? First of all, let me ask you, is this going to be a spontaneous process? It is room temperature, cold air, transferring heat to a warm cup of coffee at 20, 75 degrees Celsius. My third question. A, yes, B, no. Is it, is it going to be spontaneous? A, yes, or B, no. All right, let's see. More people said yes than no. Let's let's imagine what we have here, okay? The room is at 70, your coffee is at 75 degrees Celsius. Okay, so, uh, oops, what, what happened? Okay. You have coffee. 75 degrees Celsius. <laughs> okay. So you have coffee at 75 degrees Celsius. That's a warm cup of coffee, right? Boiling is 100 degrees. And your room is at 25 degrees Celsius. According to this, you're going to transfer heat from the room, so your heat transfer goes this way, from the room, the cold room air at room temperature to a warm cup of coffee. You know that's not gonna be spontaneous, right? What happens to your warm cup of coffee? Eventually gets cold, goes to room temperatures. What's the spontaneous process? Heat going from your coffee to the room, so it's not spontaneous. It's not spontaneous. So do you expect delta S for this to be A, positive, or B, negative for the universe? Do you expect delta S for the universe to be positive or negative? System and surroundings. Anytime you say universe, that's everything. The clock the room and the coffee together. What does the second law say? If the process is spontaneous, delta S is positive. Since this is not spontaneous, delta S is negative, okay? It's a non-spontaneous process. So delta S is negative. Can we calculate delta S for this? 
Okay, let's calculate delta S for the room. The room air. Pretty much you can assume the room air is more or less going to stay at 25 degrees Celsius, right? It's not going to warm up to 75. A cup of coffee is not going to make it heat up too much, right? So we can assume it's pretty much at 298 Kelvin. How much heat was transferred? Five, right? Five joules. Did the room, according to this, you're assuming that heat was transferred from the room to the coffee. So what's the algebraic sign of Q for of delta H for your room? Yeah, your room lost energy, right? It gave that energy to the coffee. So Q for heat, the heat from the room is negative. So negative 5.0 over 298 would be... Five divided by two ninety eight is point zero one seven. Okay. I'm just gonna have to keep one extra digit. Point zero one six eight. Negative point zero one six eight <laughs> joules per kelvin. As expected, the entropy of the room went down. Heat left the room, right? What happens to the entropy of your coffee? Let's just say it's same as water, right? Same specific heat. So what's the formula for delta S? You didn't say what temperature the the coffee went down to, right? But let's just say, let's just imagine that this amount of heat is not going to cause its temperature to change. Okay, that's just to make things simple. So it's going to be plus five joules. And so what's the temperature of the coffee? 75, okay. What's 75 in Kelvin? How much? 348 Kelvin. What's the delta S for the coffee? Five divided by 348. It's point zero. Actually, we can't calculate how much the coffee's temperature is going to drop, all right? Let's do that so we can write the correct formula. Okay. Let me, let's not do it this way. Let's do it the right way. So what's the delta T for the coffee? Q equals C delta T, right? What's delta T for the coffee? Q over C, right? So delta T, how much heat? Five positive five joules came it went into the coffee, right? What's delta T for the coffee? I mean C for the coffee. What's the specific heat of the coffee? Four point one eight joules per Kelvin per gram. Okay. Uh, I did not tell you how many grams of coffee we have, but a cup of coffee, approximately how many, how many grams is that? Can you tell me? I'm just estimating here. Let's say a cup of coffee is, uh, let's say your regular soda, 12 ounce cans, about the size of your soda can, 12 ounces. So what's 12 ounces in gram, milliliters? Have you ever looked at how many milliliters you have on your soda bottle where it says where it says 12 ounces? I think it's like 255 milliliters. Okay, let's just make sure. Uh, milliliters to ounce. Okay. Yeah. Ounce to do. Let's do ounce to milliliters. One ounce is 30 milliliters, okay? So 12 ounces times 30 to 60. It's about, it's actually 255. If you do that, let's see. 29.57 times, oops. 29.57 times uh, 12 ounces, right? 355. Is that right? 29 times 
29.57 times 12 ounces, 355. Yeah, it's 355 on your soda can, okay? So 355, so if, if it's mostly water, how many grams will that be? 355 grams, right? Water is the one gram per mil. So let's do that. So let's assume you have 355 grams of coffee. 355 grams of water in your coffee and it's pretty much just water so what's our delta t it's 5 divided by 4.18 divided by 355 5 divided by 4.18 divided by 355 all right, 4.18 times 355, and then divide that. Okay, five divided by 4.18 divided by 355. That's 3.00337. Okay, so you can see it doesn't change very much, right? The temperature doesn't change very much. In fact, this temperature actually goes up, right? Positive. Why would the temperature go up? You're assuming heat went into your coffee, right? This is, we're just pretending that the room transferred heat to your coffee. The temperature of your coffee went up by 0 0.037. So uh, it's within the sig figs of our temperature. We're going to say 75 plus 0 0.0037. It's not going to change very much. Okay? So, what's delta S then for the coffee? It's delta H over T, right? It's pretty much constant temperature. So, it's going to be plus 5.0 joules over, what's the temperature of your coffee? 348 Kelvin. So, how much is that? Five divided by three forty eight point zero point zero one four four two six it's joules per Kelvin. Okay. So point zero one six eight and point zero one four four. What's the delta S total? That's system plus surroundings. Negative point zero one six eight plus 0 0.0144 joules per Kelvin. And what would that number be? And remember, we only have two sig figs here, right? 0 0.0168 plus 0 0.0144 is negative, 0 0.0024. Negative point oh oh two four. Why should it be negative? Because we know it's not going to happen, right? We expect it to be negative. Okay. So S entropy of the universe gives us a guide as to whether something has a natural tendency to occur. If it does, we expect the entropy of the universe to go up. But then you have to be looking at the entropy of the system and the surroundings. Okay. Uh, standard entropies uh, defi is defined as the entropy change that you need to heat at constant pressure of one bar, which is essentially one atmosphere. One point one bar. One atmosphere is one point zero one bar. For a substance from 0 to 298 Kelvin, so from absolute 0, 0 Kelvin to room temperature, that's called the standard entropy of that substance. So keep that definition in mind. That's the, Remember, every time you heat something, what happens is entropy is going to increase, right? So this delta S would be S at 298 K minus the S at 0 Kelvin, okay? And if we're doing it at a one bar pressure, that's standard pressure. So that superscript zero there in the symbol is, stands for one bar pressure or one atmosphere pressure. That's your delta S. Okay? That's called the standard entropy of your substance. Okay. 
So given that definition, can you answer this question for me? For which of the following processes is delta S equal to the standard entropy of nitrogen gas? That's the gas that you, in the air you breathe, it's 80% of the air you breathe, you know, at room temperature, nitrogen's a gas, right? 298 Kelvin. So which of these four processes corresponds to the delta S that is equal to the standard entropy of nitrogen gas? Are you ready? What's the definition? It's the delta S if you go from 0 Kelvin to 298 Kelvin, right? So it can't be this. This starts at 0 degrees Celsius. This one's reversed from 298 to 0, right? So is it A or B? What do we know about when we get to absolute 0? What happens to gases? Eventually they turn into solids, right? So you start with nitrogen solid and change it to a gas. Okay, so the answer is A. Right. The third law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of a perfect crystalline substance, okay, approach all perfect crystalline substances, their entropy approach the same value as the temperature approaches absolute zero. And so as a matter of convenience, we're going to assume that that same value that they approach is zero, okay? The implication of the third law is that if you're looking at reactions and you want to know what the delta S for a reaction is at zero Kelvin, then you can just say it's going to be zero because all substances will have the same entropy at zero Kelvin. Then the delta S, the change in entropy when the reaction happens at zero Kelvin, if it were to happen at zero Kelvin, would be zero. Like I said, as a matter of convenience, we define that to be zero. So the standard entropy, okay, remember that's the difference between the entropy at 298 Kelvin and the entropy at zero Kelvin, then that's also known as a third law entropy or the absolute entropy, okay? So it's also known as a third law entropy because uh, you can say that's the difference between the entropy at 298 and the entropy at 0 Kelvin is just the entropy at 298 because we're assuming the value at 0 is 0. Okay? So application of the third law is this. It allows us to calculate delta S for a reaction where you start with reactants at 298 Kelvin and end up with products at 298 Kelvin. So what we do is this. We imagine cooling your reactants from 298 Kelvin to 0 Kelvin. What's the delta S for that? Step. Delta S for step one. Okay, this is step one. Would just be one. This is the negative of the entropy of the reactants, right? Negative of the standard entropy of the reactants. Okay. Then if we imagine that we have the reaction happening at zero Kelvin. What's the delta S for step two? What does the third law say? Delta S for step two. A reaction at zero Kelvin, delta S is zero. Okay. Now that we've converted the reactants to products at zero Kelvin, okay, so our product reactants are now are now converted to products at zero Kelvin. We now imagine those products at zero Kelvin, you heat them up so that we end up with products at 298 Kelvin. So we go down to zero, okay, your reactants go down from 298 Kelvin to zero, change them to products at zero, bring them back up to products at 298 Kelvin. Delta S for step three would be one. It's just the entropy of the sum of the entropy, uh, standard entropies of the products. So negative entropy of standard entropy of reactants plus zero plus the standard entropy of the products. And so that allows you to calculate delta S for reaction. Okay. 
and you can look up values of standard entropies from table. So you can calculate the delta S for any reaction as just the entropy of the products. Okay. You can see it's just the end sum of the standard entropies of the products minus the standard entropies of the reactants. That will give you the delta S for a reaction. Okay. So let's calculate the delta S for this reaction. You need to look up a table of standard entropies. Okay. And otherwise, unless otherwise specified, we're interested in temp reactions happening at 298 Kelvin. Okay, so let's uh, look up, where can we look up delta S values? A good source would be the back of your book. There's a table there. Or you can go to webbook.nist.gov. And then you click on NIST Chemistry Webbook and you do a search. So what are we interested in? NH3. So we look at gas phase data for NH3. Ammonia. And if you look at entropy, uh, standard entropy of a gas at one bar is 192.77 joules per Kelvin per mole. Okay. So for ammonia, it's 192.77. So for this one, it's 192.77 joules per Kelvin per mole. What's the standard entropy of H2? Uh, let's do a search for H2. Oops. H2. Hydrogen. Standard entropy of H2 is... 130.68 joules per Kelvin per mole. 130.68 joules per Kelvin per mole. Okay. And we do the same thing for N2. Let's do search. Search for N2. And that's nitrogen. And what's the value for nitrogen? It's 191.61 okay. joules per Kelvin per mole. 191.61 joules per Kelvin per mole. So what's our delta S? It's a formula for delta S. Entropy of the products minus entropy of the reactant. So standard entropy of the products minus the standard entropy of the reactants. And so what would those be? What's our product? Ammonia. We have two moles, okay? So two moles of ammonia times 192.77. Okay, let me fix that. Two moles of ammonia times 192.77 joules per Kelvin per mole. That's your entropy of your products. Minus entropy of, uh, so this is products right here, your ammonia. Minus for the reactants, what is it? Three moles of H2, so three moles times the entropy standard entropy of H2 is 130.68 joules per Kelvin per mole okay plus so that takes care of hydrogen and nitrogen is one mole so one mole times 191.61 one mole of nitrogen times, what was that? 191.61 joules per Kelvin per mole. So, mole cancels out. So, what's the answer? Someone calculate that for me.
two times one ninety two point seventy seven minus three times one thirty point sixty eight okay. minus one ninety one point six one that's a delta s of negative one ninety eight point eleven. One nine eight point one one joules per Kelvin okay, per mole of reaction. So negative one nine eight point eleven. That's the delta S for your reaction. You got that? Uh, the delta S for this is negative. Uh, negative. What was it? One nine eight point eleven. Joules per Kelvin. Okay? So, uh, that's how you calculate delta S. Okay. This might be a good time to pause.